uh, thank you for connecting once again. We were in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, I see a message here on the chat. Kennedy is saying, repeat verse 12, please. Okay, so verse 12, uh, basically it says that the word of God is living. So we said that the word of God engages with us uh, and it is powerful. And then we talked about the functions of God's word, where God's word is able to transform us. God's word is able to build faith. It's able to cleanse us. Um, and we saw that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, you know, cutting between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. In other words, God's word is able to analyze and diagnose the thoughts and intents of our heart. So that is in uh, summation what verse 12 is all about. Uh, and I hope that uh, helps Kennedy. Uh, we will now move ahead with chapter 5. We've seen that the Lord Jesus was introduced as a compassionate high priest. Uh, when we began Hebrews, we said that these believers were quite soaked in their culture and uh, they were aware of uh, several of these Jewish practices and the writer to the Hebrews had to establish the greatness of Jesus, the value of uh, salvation which was brought through the death of Christ for them and uh, he had to establish the greater value of these things in comparison to their rituals and practices. Okay, so uh, we find that the book of Hebrews addresses many of these practices. So starting now, we'll uh, talk so much about the, uh, the tabernacle, we'll talk about covenant, we'll talk about uh, sacrifices, okay? Uh, high priest. So these are all terms that they were familiar with. And uh, the writer now has to give them the new, uh, new testament or the new covenant perspective of these things. Uh, now, even if we have the slightest idea about what all of these things are, uh, we can still see what the writer is actually trying to say. So, so far, we've uh, understood about Jesus being a high priest. We know that a high priest is somebody who uh, is assigned okay, to uh, take charge of the temple or the tabernacle worship. This person is meant to minister to God, but at the same time, represent the people. And that's who Jesus is. Uh, he is now talked about the high priest. He ministers in the presence of God now in heaven. But at the same time, he is our representative. And we saw the beauty of it in those verses, Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16, where uh, a high priest would be chosen from among men to uh, be their representative. Now, Jesus, because he had become a man for us and he had gone through the human experiences, is now a right representative for us as human beings. And not just that, his sympathy for us reveals that he is a compassionate high priest. And that gives us boldness to enter into God's presence despite any of our shortcomings. Now, let's continue to see this high priest and, uh, you know, who he is and uh, many of, of the qualities of Jesus as our high priest. So coming to Hebrews chapter 5 here, I want to request uh, somebody to please read from verses 1 to 4, then we'll uh, try and understand them. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sin, sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants 
such an honor. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. Okay, thank you, Ko. Uh, we have talked about some of those attributes earlier, where we said that somebody from among men is appointed. So Jesus, because of his humanity, he is appointed for us. Then he, a uh, high priest, normally offers gifts and sacrifices for sins. Jesus did that. He did not have to do it for himself, but he took our sins in his own body and was nailed to the cross, as 1 Peter 2.24 says. So he did offer, make an offering for sins, but it was not his sins, but our sins. But the high priest, obviously, to enter into God's presence, first he had to make offerings for sacrifices for himself to cleanse himself and then also for the people okay what else uh, a high priest should be compassionate and uh, uh, compassionate especially for those who are going astray it says now was jesus like that yes he was uh, greatly like that because what he did was for the entire world and the word of god says while we were still sinners when we we like sheep you know uh, have gone astray but still god says that his love came looking for us so jesus died for us when we couldn't understand why he was dying for us so that shows us the kind of compassion this high priest has for us and he uh, cares for those who uh, are ignorant those who are going astray from him and uh, a high priest you know, because of his own weaknesses he's able to understand uh, those who are facing weaknesses and we talked about how jesus and his humanity experienced you know many limitations and temptations now verse 3 it says because of this he is required as for the people so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins we've talked about that and verse 4 very very important no man takes this honor to himself but he who is called by god just as aaron was so another important thing that we are told here about that high priestly ministry is it's not uh you know it, it's it's not by the choice of a human being or the choice of many human beings or democratic it's not like that but it is assigned by god so uh, in a sense you can say that god elects or god chooses god appoints uh, people in that high priestly priestly role we see that in the old testament aaron was chosen by god and his descendants you know the levite tribe they were chosen by god to do the priestly ministry and in the same way jesus was appointed by god so it's not like uh, any human being can just take it or even jesus can just take it that he was appointed he was positioned by god chosen by god to be the high priest and uh, that is how you know we would view him so for the jewish believer that's a great thing because jesus we already saw how he is the only begotten of the father by inheritance uh, he is so great uh, but at the same time, because he lived a life of obedience, God gave him you know, that honor again. And now the honor of being a high priest is also given by God to Jesus. And so the greatness of this high priest is uh, 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 not comparable or incomparable to other human high priests who have been so far and uh, uh, we will see later that actually there is no no more need for uh, any human high priest anymore. So let's go ahead and read further from verses 5 through 10. Uh, another volunteer, please. 
Okay, Shri Kumar, you have something to say. Uh, let's let's hear from Shri Kumar first, and then we will read the yeah. next section. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I want to know one thing that um, in the yeah. Old Testament, when we uh, the role of the high priest was so prominent and it was so important, uh, but in the New Testament, we we never uh, you know. Uh, even though we know that Jesus is our high priest, but we never, um, you know, we never use that term or we never use that position of Jesus. Um, is it because of the lack of, uh, like, no, we have never heard that the people pray that we are bringing our uh, sacrifices to our high priest. Uh, in that sense, we never used to do. So, is it because of the lack of revelation or, um, or that uh, that that I just want to know? Thank you. Okay, uh, Jesus as a high priest. So Jesus as a high priest, uh, I I am not sure, Shri Kumar, because I think it's not really it's not the lack of revelation. We do understand, and many of us know that he is a high priest. He has functioned in that role of a high priest, uh, and even now he's in the presence of the Father, um, making intercession. Uh, but at the same time, he has he is that representative of the people as well but for whatever reason we we don't mention it i don't know i don't know why uh, anyone else would you have an answer to that question um, what's that? Yes, yes, Mangi. Um, yeah, please go ahead, Mangi. Yeah, yeah. We, okay, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Jesus is our high priest, and we don't have to represent it because there's only one high priest who represents us before God, and he he was the one who, with his blood, cleansed. Um, the temple in heaven and with his blood we, we were all forgiven so it, it is an act that cannot be repeated it was it's something that is done once and everything else was finished so our freedom our salvation everything was done and it cannot be repeated so that's why we don't um, we don't imitate him or we don't do anything Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you, Mangi. Uh, that uh, makes sense to me. So, uh, Shikumar, what Mangi is saying is because that work, that major work is already done of, uh, uh, you know, sacrificing himself. Uh, and these, these practices cease to exist. Uh, we no longer call Jesus the high priest, though he is. Okay, so that's Mangi's uh, take on it, and I'm I'm quite convinced by that. Uh, is that all right? Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mangi. I believe okay. that is the truth. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, yes, Divya. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I I I just wanted to also add, like maybe it's also because it's in a Jewish setting that uh, the author is writing this, so it makes more sense for the jews to understand the high priest in terms of that sort even uh, when they talk about the tabernacle and all those things it makes more sense for the jews rather than a uh, new testament uh, i mean to say a uh, gentile believer yeah thank you yes thank you divya so familiarity because they are more familiar than these terms uh, are useful for them, they have a better understanding. But for us, yeah, we've 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 uh, received the truth, uh, but we don't necessarily repeat uh, these things often enough. So that would be the reason. Uh, yes, Christopher. Yes, also maybe something to add, and uh, I think it also uh, relates to what Maggie mentioned. Uh, is that um, you know the, the 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 term high priest is kind of got a human con connotation to it and you know um uh jesus is has you know has has uh, 
he's not a human. I mean, he is not a he's not in the earth anymore. So you know, it's uh, he's he's God is right. He's gone back to his rightful place uh, next to uh, next to God the Father. To him as you know the high priest uh, from a from a human aspect, but uh, you know he's uh, he just you know worship him and uh, communicate with him as as um, as uh, as a god as as god basically. So yeah. That's what I want to understand. Sure. So uh, we see Jesus um, in his role of being God and acknowledge that uh, more often as compared to his earthly role uh, of, uh, or, or rather his role of uh, being a high priest. Okay. Uh, now, as we go through the book of Hebrews, we'll also see it's it's a very beautiful thing because uh, the high priest made sacrifices and those sacrifices were, uh, you know, primarily the, the ones to remove sin and all were animals. But the beauty of, of uh, what God has done is, Hebrews will tell us, Jesus is the high priest, but Jesus is also the sacrifice. Okay, so there are all these uh, these things that we will talk about Jesus. So then when we are addressing Jesus, uh, we'll have to, if we are not acknowledging him as high priest often enough, um, you know, the question might arise, why are we not acknowledging him as a sacrifice often enough? But, you know, these things are all there and we receive these uh, truths. But as uh, Christopher, Christopher was pointing out, we acknowledge him as God ultimately okay and which is why the others sort of take the back seat uh, okay nice nice questions uh, there uh, let's continue with uh, what the author is saying here he talked about jesus as the appointed high priest so from verses 5 to 10 uh, did anyone have anything to say Okay, so let's read these verses. Uh, someone could read it out. Yeah, verses uh, 5 to 10. Uh, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, was also able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son yet, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we are must say, and hard to explain, since we have become dull of hearing. Yes, thank you, Christopher. Thank you for that. Um, so we continue to read about Jesus as the, the high priest. Um, and again, the thought that he was appointed so christ did not glorify himself so it was not a self-promotion uh we we read in philippians 2 that he humbled himself and so god gave him the name which is above every other name so another important thing that we can understand about jesus is his humility uh, from everywhere the author is pointing to the fact that he is God. He, uh, you know, he was that uh, perfect representative for us. And so many wonderful things about Jesus. But he did not exalt himself. Uh, it was God who appointed him. God who gave him that name. God, in this case, in this context, uh, God who made him the high priest. And again, there's a repetition of that uh, scripture where God says or the father says to uh, the son, you are my son. I have begotten you. So 
there is that acknowledging uh, of the uh, belonging or acceptance of the sun so within the godhead we see uh, a beautiful synchrony uh, you know a beautiful sort of dynamics going on there where the father the son and the holy spirit it, it's like they love each other uh, and they honor each other they respect each other uh, and it, it's all mutual the way this interaction this relationship takes place no wonder you know god expects that in a human uh, in, in a human relationships because everything that uh, he is he he wanted that to be reflected in who adam and eve were and mankind is so it, it's really beautiful where god is honoring the father is honoring jesus uh, jesus was glorified by the father and uh, the father is saying you are my son um, i have begotten you uh, and uh, you are a priest forever according to the order of melchizedek so what is the order of melchizedek we will talk about it now the priests who existed they existed according to the order of aaron because Aaron was the first person who was anointed as a high priest and his descendants thereafter took over the role of a high priest but Jesus is from another order okay is he is he uh, from the order of the levites no we know that because he's from the tribe of judah and uh, nobody from the tribe of judah was appointed as a high priest but though jesus was from the tribe of judah he is from the order of melchizedek now who is melchizedek we will talk about melchizedek uh, in depth in the coming uh, you know the upcoming chapters for now just understand that jesus is appointed he is appointed according to an order then was seven Uh, again talking about jesus you know the life of jesus see the the uh, greatness of jesus is both assigned appointed uh, inherited we've seen those terms but also it is i'm using the word earned with with uh, uh, you know a great sense of fear that it's not misunderstood but earned also it's also earned because of the kind of righteous faithful obedient life that jesus lived uh, towards the father so yes it came by inheritance sometimes we think oh it comes by inheritance it's so easy but jesus never abused his position he never uh, misused his authority or uh, uh, you know the uh, the privileges that were given to him so all this shows a life of incredible humility if there is one person who could have bragged about himself it's jesus because from every side his greatness uh, is is just uncom incomparable but then he chose to walk in humility and he chose to walk in obedience now that he has walked in obedience that sort of adds to his credibility Okay, uh, because of his character, because of his behavior, his attitude, as well. So, what about Jesus's attitude and behavior? From verse seven, it says, "Who in the days of his flesh, meaning in his humanity, when he uh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear." So, Jesus. was constantly relating to the father and that's why prayers and prayers and supplication with vehement cries it also says tears so this is the time when jesus went through you could say one of his um uh you know his his valley experiences and that was in the garden of gethsemane where uh, he wa he was uh, overwhelmed by this reality that very soon he had to go to the cross uh, and so he was crying out to the father we know this right like matthew 26 where he was saying god if it's possible take it away from me but he was he was in anguish 
because even here the writer uses words like cries tears so anguish very painful situation but even in that painful situation he sees god as the the uh, you know the the provider as a deliverer oh it's god who is able to rescue me and so i have to talk to god i have to pray so you see that a place of dependence on god the way jesus talked about um, the vine and the branches you abide in me my words abide in you but here's the reality even jesus abided in the father like that so that is why he can make a demand from us and say why don't you do the same thing so he depended on the father we generally depend on on uh, you know our our uh, best help during our time of difficulty and here he's depending on the father in his toughest moments uh, so there's a dependence but also the scripture points out his godly fear okay so same thing if if we see uh, somebody who has an incredible inheritance let's say you know the family has wealth and this person has uh, inheritance uh, uh, sometimes it gets to people's heads and uh, they can be very rash uh, you know in decisions and relationships because everything has come uh, it's been handed uh, given into their hands but look at the attitude of jesus even though he has inherited greatness a uh, great name uh, son sonship from the father there is godly fear associated with jesus again isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 also says the spirit of the lord the spirit of the fear of god so that is reverence so how was the life of jesus it was a life of reverence so there was never a a, a proud uh, you know a very um, insensitive way of of living life but no it was a life which chose to honor god reverence god uh, you know walk in the fear godly fear uh, unto the lord so that's how jesus lived and he was walking aligned with the father that's something we are seeing here was it uh, though he was a son yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered so he is already uh, a son and he is uh, perfected was jesus perfect yes he was perfect in the sense that uh, you know we uh, we read how though he was tempted he was yet without sin so he lived an overcoming life he lived a perfect life even though you know he was perfect the bible does talk about jesus learning obedience through suffering now very often uh, this question comes uh, you know to the teachers of uh, god's word when we talk about god's love and uh, god's grace and how god is not the author of suffering god does not uh, uh, inflict sickness and disease on people uh, the question arises people say hey but through these difficulties through sickness disease uh, many times people become better okay they uh, they are transformed they uh, develop better attitudes so uh, do you think god can give sickness and disease to make people a better version of themselves well uh, when we answer this question one thing that we have to establish is that see god does not uh, god does not put you know uh, uh, sickness so he doesn't want to put us into uh, trials and and things like that okay however because we are in this world we do encounter Uh, the things that happen in the world like sickness disease there are trials uh, however you know we also see that sometimes god does let us go through tests but tests are always to promote us tests are always to help us come up higher in god but when it comes to uh, thrusting us into trials and sickness and disease god doesn't uh, he is not the author of those things however the other side is that challenges and difficulties can help us become better people depending on our response okay so we should we cannot downplay that 
can sufferings make a person better uh, actually the answer is yes if they respond properly to those sufferings they can because even in the life of jesus it says he learned obedience so what did it produce a life of difficulties i i uh, when i was in school or college i had seen a book which uh, i forget the title now but something to the uh, to the essence of make use of your adversities you know uh, some something like that and i used to wonder like how could how can you make use of the difficulties sometimes life just happens you don't plan to get sick or you don't plan to uh, uh, have a loss or a failure or undergo an accident something happens these things we don't plan but even if things go wrong what can what does the bible tell us see in sufferings with the right attitude we can actually uh, we can actually gain from it and no wonder james again you know he says when you go through all kinds of trials difficulties rejoice he says because for a believer even difficulties trials sufferings um, these things cannot crush us we can only get stronger even if such things come our way and that is the example of jesus for us he used sufferings to learn obedience to god and even we can do that we can become more obedient to god because of the sufferings that we may be going through verse 9 and having been perfected so here again people ask the question wasn't he perfect enough that he needed to be perfected but let's understand this in the context of his human experience it says that he dealt with them well he dealt with them in the right manner to benefit from uh, those sufferings so having been perfected he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him called by god as high priest according to the order of melchizedek uh, i hope you have understood that are there any uh, comments on that or i'll just go forward with verse 11 yeah yeah okay so uh, let's proceed if if at all anyone wants to interject you can sure okay so the next section here verses 11 through 14 uh, could we have a volunteer please can i read next to yes sir about this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing for though by this time you have had to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of god you need milk not solid food for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child but so but solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil okay thank you asha uh, this section is about uh, maturity so so far there were uh, different themes which were relevant to the jewish people and through it all the author tried to establish establish jesus's greatness uh, and also talk about how faith is important uh, to keep continuing in the rest that god provides and uh, uh, you know now he he said that even jesus uh, he went through sufferings but through those sufferings he learned obedience uh, and now continuing in that in that um, with the intention of encouraging the believers bringing them up higher uh, he he has this section in here which is telling them to become mature in god you know, maturity is very important in our christian walk when we become a believer it's just the beginning of the journey uh, we, where, where are we journeying to what is the end result you know romans 8:29 it it tells us that the ultimate goal is to become like jesus 
know that is what god wants for us we mu we must become like jesus and that is maturity become like jesus in our character become like jesus in uh, our integrity become like jesus in uh, the power of god's word demonstrated through our lives so become like jesus in everything uh, from verse 11 you know it it's a word of exhortation where he says uh, uh, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing so it, it sounds very negative but it, it's what he's saying is see all these realities and the truth is before you but your discouragement is not letting you see these things uh, and he is reminding them by now from verse 12 he says for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of god uh, and you have come to need milk and not solid food so he is actually feeling bad and he's telling them that uh, you know the fact is that all of you should have been at a uh, a great Uh, you should have covered a long distance in your journey by now because that is the potential which all of you have uh, but then what has happened you have remained in that position of immaturity maybe because of your discouragement maybe because of your interest in worldly things uh, that the things of this world have uh, taken such a part in you such a place in your heart that you're not able to fully yield to god and make that journey of maturity so he's even saying that if at all you would have yielded to the word of god and walked in obedience by now you as believers you know you could have become teachers or he's saying see what is the quality of mature believers mature believers are like you know just take the example of parents and uh, children parents are people who nurture you know they know how to take care of themselves at at the same time they take responsibility for their young children to train them to provide for them uh, to help them guide them so uh, we would say parents are mature whereas little children are not mature because they are still very dependent they cannot even take care of themselves so that's the point he is making here he is saying as believers you should have come to that position of being able to nurture others long ago but look at you he says you should have been able to teach others uh, the oracles of god or the truth of god's word but you are still in a place so here's the second quality one quality of mature believers is that they can take care of themselves in the faith and they can help others now the second quality of mature believers is they are able to accept or they are able to understand and receive depths of god's word so god's word by now we recognize that uh, you know there are there are greater levels that we can go to in the word of god for a young believer like a little child can only consume milk you know no parent will will feed a, a less than a one year old meat or you know uh, uh, something that they are not able to digest because they don't have the capacity they have not developed the capacity and that's a sign of uh, like a physical immaturity that point of that child's life uh, hopefully as they grow they will get the ability to digest solid food but here he saying as believers the second quality of maturity is we should we should not remain in the basics all the time if we remain in the basics all the time somewhere we are missing out that maturity you know get into solid food stop drinking milk get into solid food then uh, uh, was 13 he says for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe again third thing if you want to notice here he, he uses the word unskilled 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 is uh, you know if you if you give some uh, instruments let's say sculpting instruments to uh, somebody who doesn't know sculpture and give them a piece of rock or wood or something and say okay come on work on this they wouldn't know how to uh, chisel away unnecessary parts and what to do and 
they wouldn't have the skill to sculpt out something beautiful but at the same time when you give it to a skilled person basically skilled means they know how to use the word or they know how to use the instruments so in the same way maturity is to be able to use the word apply the word how do i apply the word in my own life my needs uh, you know my situations and even if somebody comes up to us we are able to use the word and say hey okay i think this is what god's word is saying in your situation so the ability to use the word again is a sign of maturity uh, verse 14 he says but solid food belongs to those who are of full age so notice full age teachers uh, skilled those who are able to eat solid food all these are references to a more mature believer okay was journeyed in the lord and come to a, a a stronger position in god so here he says full age or somebody who's grown up in god that is those who by reason of using use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil so what is this basically it's saying you know how uh, we look at older people in our in our uh, uh, communities and we go to them for advice or we go to them for counsel uh, because they have experience you know they can they can because of their experience they can tell okay this would be the right decision or you know something would be the wrong choice in the same way when it comes to the use of god's word when there is a believer who has lived in the word so much they have studied it they have applied it they have taught it they have used it so much in their lives uh, very quickly such a believer can tell this is right that is wrong okay so discerning the ability to discern is another quality of a mature believer they can tell right from wrong but a young believer may not be able to tell what is correct what is not correct everything is in the word but how do we apply this what is the right thing to do they may not be able to tell so the ability to discern is also something that a mature believer has so notice there uh, the ability to discern comes from exercising the senses uh, or our spiritual senses when we are constantly using them okay uh, in prophecy we talk about this isn't it a lot of people ask this question how can i tell if it is god how can i tell if it is god you know my own uh, opinion well if you have done it over and over and over again okay if you have exercised your senses to hear from god you know at some point you're in a place where it doesn't take much to recognize and say this is god god is telling me to do this okay because we have exercised our spiritual senses our sense of seeing our sense of hearing our sense of discernment and we are able to tell distinguish or judge uh, right from wrong Okay, so let me take a quick pause here. Any thoughts about maturity uh, before we jump into Hebrews chapter six? Growing up in God, uh, yes, Sylvia. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so uh, when uh, we first discussed regarding. uh how jesus christ was perfected or he learned obedience through suffering uh so is that and the maturity part right um is that related uh that's my question uh is that related so jesus christ learning obedience through suffering is that is that maturity is that what you're asking yeah like um, that perfection right coming yeah. into perfection Correct. so uh, is that um, so for a believer uh, from a believer's point of view um, we are also like maturing into that uh, into that perfection uh, through uh, you know we we ought to actually the uh, author is saying that we ought to Uh, mature into that perfection so i believe even obedi uh, like uh, the suffering and uh, obeying to god's uh, uh, 
you know, God's working in our lives, yielding to it is also part of uh, that maturity, right? Yeah, that's that's true. Because see, uh, over there it says uh, Jesus, he was perfected through his obedience. And over here, uh, I'll just look up that word. Full age, those who are of full age. In the in the Greek, there is a word called teleos, um, which refers to maturity. Okay, I, I I think there's another passage. Yeah, in Ephesians four, that word is used. Uh, Till we all come to the perfect man, teleos. Now that teleos is related to this full age. So yes, even here perfection is being talked of, talked about. Uh, the kind and Jesus also became perfect through his obedience, right? So our goal is to become more like Jesus. So if sufferings through his obedience uh, uh, in the uh, event of sufferings that made him perfect then obviously it's the same way it will work in our lives also so our obedience is very uh, necessary for us to mature uh, in god okay thank you thank you ma'am yeah sure thank you any other thoughts about maturity spiritual maturity Okay, Kennedy has uh, a point here. What what do you mean by spiritual sense against physical sense? Okay, so Kennedy, uh, spiritual sense or senses are the ability of our spirit man. And we have learned in uh, other courses that our physical man, you know, has senses. Like we can see, we can uh, taste, we can touch. We can hear. Uh, so similarly, our spirit man also has senses, uh, more if you will, if not just these few senses that I mentioned, our physical senses, the spirit man may have many more senses, many more senses. And those spirit senses have to be, to be developed. Like for, for someone who is a foodie or someone who is into uh, the uh, food business, you know, obviously they they may uh, they may have uh, trained their their sense of taste to they, they may have exposed it to a variety of of tastes and you know their their sense of a taste thereby has been developed. Similarly, when it comes to our spiritual senses, when we are exposing ourselves to the word of God, to the voice of God, and you know, all those things, what happens is we become more discerning and, and our abilities uh, become more fine tuned, you know, and uh, thereby we are immediately able to distinguish what is spirit, what is flesh. And I hope uh, that answers your question. Okay, great. All right. So I think we will wrap up here um, because uh, we need some continuity when we step into Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, and so I'll start off with the, the next class. Uh, let's uh, pray and close off for today. I uh, would like to request uh, anybody to lead, lead us in a word of prayer. Shall I pray? Yes, sir. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, beautiful session, Lord, that uh, you gave us the opportunity uh, to attend. Uh, bless Pastor Nancy. Bless every student here. Whatever truths, Lord, we learned about you, about your words, Lord, uh, in relationship with uh, uh, the Father, in relationship with us. Uh, Father, Lord, the um, spiritual maturity, Father, that uh, we all, um, Lord, uh, should uh, aim towards. Uh, but we pray, Father, that you help us grow uh, into that uh, perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, thank you and praise you. Um, bless uh, each one for the rest of the sessions, Father. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. 
come in. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a blessed day and a wonderful weekend ahead. Uh, we will connect again uh, next week. Up until then, you know, please do go through the book of Hebrews. I read it a couple of times over and over again. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.